So now that we've given a quick overview of the OO parts of Java, let's do a deeper dive in data and control abstraction. What you'll discover with data and control abstraction is that it's really all about hiding you from details that are likely to change. And we'll show you why that's useful. And of course, the main reason for having abstraction is to avoid breaking things when stuff changes. That's, that's the main thing. That's another good quiz question. Why is abstraction useful? Um, and I'll briefly talk about some features that implement control and data abstractions. And I'll show you some examples of these things in the context of this image counter app, which is a heavily stripped down version of the assignment that you'll be working on all semester. This is stripped down because all it does is it just goes through at some root in an inheritance or in a tree structured, recursively structured tree folder directory, and it counts the number of images that are rooted at that URL or URI. So take a look at this code. I'll, I'll show you snippets of it, and we'll talk about it. OK, so abstraction is essential. You, you know, everything in programming languages is about abstraction these days at one level or another. And it's typically either control abstraction or data abstraction. Why is abstraction relevant? It emphasizes what's important, and it de-emphasizes what's not important, what's implementation detail, at a given level of abstraction. So you'll see a good example is a class, right? The class is public methods and maybe fields, but typically methods are what you see. And anything that's private is hidden. So it's de-emphasizing the representation. And the reason for that's pretty obvious. Um, we'll talk about that in a second. Java supports a whole bunch of powerful abstractions. This was me having way too much fun with the PowerPoint. <laughs> There's data abstractions, which are basically sets of values and operations that, that operate on those values. And we'll take a look at a whole bunch of those. You can see here for more information about what data abstraction is. The key concept in data abstraction is that data, or the state, should only be accessible through APIs, application programming interfaces. Again, you probably know that. Um, and the reason for doing that is that if things change, like you move from a linked list representation of a stack to an array implementation of a stack, or vice versa, that any code that is using the stack won't have to change. It won't break. So you've shielded yourself from representational changes. Really, really, really important concept. And you'll get chances to play around with that. Hopefully, you learned that in 251, if not other places. There's also control abstractions, which really determine which of the paths, if there's a choice, which of the paths to follow, and how often to do the paths. And we'll see that there's a bunch of different ways to do that. So let's talk about some quick examples here. Before I do that, though, I'm going to give you an overview of the, the example. So this is the image counter example. And what it does is it basically gets you a way to crawl a website starting at a, a root point. And uh, every time you go and you visit a web page, it'll do two things. It will count the number of images that are accessible directly through that page. And for all the hyperlinks that are on that page, it'll recursively go ahead and visit those hyperlinks, which could be on the same page or somewhere else in the internet, in the web, and then count the images accessible there. But it only goes up to a certain limit. So here, if you run it, it goes by default to my, my web page, which I set up deliberately to do something in a particular way. And it starts out at the root, and it goes and it looks down and finds the images that are accessible through the, the root. And then it, maybe there's zero, maybe there's one. And then it recursively follows the other links. So you can see it goes to images, which is a link accessible through the top link and another link that's accessible through the top link. And it recursively counts the number. In this case, there were 12 images at each sublink. And it'll also look to see if it's already visited a link. So it skips ones it's already seen. We'll look at how that's done in a second. And once it gets to a certain depth, in this case, I limited it to two because I didn't want it to recurse indefinitely, it stops. So once you get here, it says, OK, I'm done. Um, and then it comes back and gives you a total count of the number of images that you could get from that page. Now, your program that you'll be doing as the assignments will do more interesting things than just count. And uh, in particular, they'll you know, download the images and ultimately display them and so on and so forth. So it'll be a lot more featureful than this. And it'll benefit from concurrency a lot more. This is just a way to show you kind of the basic concept. One of the really cool things, if you are curious and look into the program and how it's implemented, I've set this up using a wrapper around an HTML parsing library called JSOUP. 
I don't know why it's called JSOUP, but it's called JSOUP, which will parse, uh, will parse recursive structures looking for images on HTML pages. And you can run this app in two ways. One way, it'll go to a URL, and it'll go ahead and look at that. The other way is it'll actually go and look on your file system, and it'll recurse things through your local file system, which is great if you're testing and you don't have access to a network. So it'll work both ways, and my code is very cleverly designed, so you can't tell through the bulk of the code whether it's doing it local or remote. It's all hidden away in a, in a wrapper called JSuper that was just fun to write. All right, keep, keep that example in mind, because I'll come back and show you the code as I give you illustrations of these concepts. So the key thing that Java supports, much like any other good object-oriented language, or even the bad object-oriented languages, like Objective-C, uh, it supports abstract data types. Really important concept. Hopefully, you learned a lot about ADTs in CS201 and 251. And basically, uh, an ADT defines a set of data values, like here's a Java integer, and we've got an int which is the data value, and a bunch of operations on the values. And there's a whole bunch of operations you can use on an integer, right? So that's the concept. These are the things you work with. That's the state that's accessed by these methods. At the heart of data abstraction is this concept called encapsulation. And encapsulation is the means by which we enforce the abstraction. And in Java, that's typically done through public and private kinds of things. There's other other access control specifiers like protected that we'll talk about later. So you can see here, I'm, I'm using a sort of a fanciful metaphor of a time release capsule where we have the interface, like the coding on the outside, right? That's the, the class and, and interface and methods. That's the part that's visible. And then you've actually got the stuff inside that does the work. But you don't see that you know, unless you unscrew the time release capsule. And those are the fields that are going to store the data. Um, the reason for doing this is to hide the implementation details. So you can sort of think of it like a coat of armor or something that hides what's going on underneath. And the reason for doing that is you don't want the program to be able to access the internal implementation details. And the reason for that is you don't want the programs to become dependent on those details such they would break if those details were to change. And uh, so we're encapsulating the, the program from internal implementation changes to the representation. So you, know, you can think of it as a coat of armor or whatever you want to think. It's the, the thing that shields the, the data structure representation so that the outside world isn't affected. The, the, the metaphor is somewhat stretched because you wear a coat of armor to protect your innards, whereas in abstraction, your coat of armor is protecting the program from your innards, if that makes any sense. So it's kind of backwards, but it's still a nice little metaphor to think about. So Java, of course, supports that through its language features, classes, which are a blueprint for making objects. And they've got fields, like a string, which stores the state of an object, like the sequence of characters, the length of the sequence, and so on. And then we've got methods, which are used to actually implement the behaviors in the appropriate way. And that would be in things like you know, checking for the length of the string, comparing the strings, checking to see if there's something in a string, making a subsequence, making a copy, you know, all the things that you would do that are the, the behavior of the class. Objects of the same class share methods, but of course could have different values. So you may have different strings that have different values. So we may have hello and world. And uh, that's you know, an instance of this string will have a different value than an instance of this string even though they both have the same named fields, like, you know, it might be what it was called. It was called uh, <laughs> uh, value. And uh, what's interesting here is under the hood, both of these objects share the same methods. I won't talk about that right now because I don't want to get caught up in the details. But there's something in Java and C++ and so on called a virtual table or a vtable. And that's what actually stores the methods and those methods are shared between the objects just to keep it down. That, by the way, is what's known as the flyweight pattern. So you might have learned about the flyweight pattern in CS251, but it's basically a way of sharing something between objects to keep each object lighter weight. There's also something called an interface. So a class, as we'll see, is one way of providing abstraction. There's also something called an interface. And an interface basically defines a contract that specifies methods that classes must eventually implement. And a good example would be the set interface, which, which I have in my, uh, my example. You can take a look at that from the um, uh, image crawler example. 
So it's got a, just methods like is empty, contains, add, size, and so on. A Java interface only provides a subset of the features that a Java class has, right? So if, if this is the Java class pumped up on steroids and human growth hormone and protein bars and whatnot, the Java interface is like the it's kind of the scrawny little brother that doesn't have all the features that the class does. Uh, in particular, in Java 7 and earlier, an interface couldn't have implementations of, of methods, only the signatures of the methods. Now, interestingly enough, Java 8 adds something called default methods, which are really cool and which allow interfaces to have default implementations if a class does not implement them when it implements the interface. That turns out to be wildly important for things we'll talk about later, but don't worry about it right now. You can't instantiate a Java interface. You can't say, you know, <clears throat> set uh, foo or something like that. You have to implement the interface first. And that goes whether you have default methods or not. You have to implement it. So here's an example where we have the comparable interface, and then we've got an integer and a string. These are both standard Java classes that implement the compare to method, as you can see here and here, and they actually fill in whatever it means to compare an integer or compare a string. But the interface is the part that's the common part. It defines a contract, a set of methods, and so on. Let's take a quick look at how this works in our image counter example, right? So we've got a class, we've got several classes, but we have one class called image counter. And this uses classes to count the number of images within a recursive folder structure. And it's got a field called simple set, and we use that to make sure we only visit each URL once. We keep track of whether we visited it already. So that's a field. And then we've got some methods that we use to parse, obtain and parse HTML pages. We have some methods that we use to come on, um, count the number of images on a page recursively going down through the hyperlinks. We've got other methods that are used to display the results to the user conditionally, depending on whether we want to have verbose output or not, et cetera, et cetera. So that's just the behavior of that class. So if you poke around in that directory, you'll see the implementation and you'll see how these things play out. Something else that we showed here, although I didn't really talk about it, is this concept of a generic. Let's talk about that quickly as well. How many people have programmed with Java generics before, either in class or other projects? OK. That will turn out to be really important. Everything we do in class will be working with generics. Sometimes we'll be programming generic classes sometimes, but oftentimes we'll be using generic classes, usually from the Java class library. OK. Um, oh, I am, oh, we still have a couple of minutes left. All right. So generic is basically a way of parameterizing a class to accept another class as the parameter. So it's parameterizing it based on type. <clears throat> so here's an example. We have a vector, which is parameterized by the elements in the vector. And that way, it can work for all different kinds of vectors. There's several benefits that you get by using generics. One of them is you don't have to keep writing code. You don't, have, you don't have to have a vector for integers, a vector for longs, a vector for strings, which is totally duplicated. You just have a vector that's parameterized by the element. And then you can come along and, and put it in there. And that, that's, that's something called the don't repeat yourself principle, or the dry principle. You could also ensure compile time type safety, so you don't have to worry about types that are conflicting. So here's an example where we have a vector of integers and a vector of doubles, and we can't mix and match them. The type system will detect those kinds of mismatches. The Java Collections framework, which you will become extremely acquainted with in this class because it's the heart of all the stream stuff we'll talk about, uses generic classes and interfaces all over the place. You'll become quite facile with lists and array lists and hash sets and hash maps and so on. And here's a very simple example of this stuff. So simple set is a generic set that's implemented using a built-in array. I did it just to make it easy. And here's an example of the add method, which you can see here. The code that's implemented here does not depend on the type E. It only, it, you can write all this code and it'll work for any different kind of type.